Okay. Can you hear me? She can't hear me. No. Yes, doctor. Oh, good. So you can all hear me. Puna, can you hear me? Vivek, you can hear me, right? Yes, doctor. Okay, Puna, how about you? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Hang on, I gotta unmute you. Huh? Hang on, let me unmute you. Okay. You have to unmute yourself, Pune. That's it. Can yeah, you yeah. All good. Yeah. Hi, how are you? I'm very good. I like your hairstyle. You know, you glow there. You know what I mean? Look great. Thank you. <laughs> it's an interesting day. Are you looking forward for this? Can you see the screen? You see the full screen, not you, on the left side, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, you see a lot of people coming in today, I think. Uh, and those of you coming, you're most welcome. Uh, let me see participants. I mean, but Puja, please admit them all. Uh, yeah, Dr. Sarkis, I'm just admitting them as they come. Thank you. Yeah, don't worry about it. Kathy, how are you? Hello. Calf, calf. Hello. Can you? Can I you love hear me? the work you did on the DPR. That was a fantastic post, Kathy. Great job. <laughs> it's a group effort. It's oh. a group effort. Lovely teaching you. It's fantastic job. Those composites, but seriously, I could have done better if, I mean, that was great work. To me, that's wonderful that you could do all that. And there's many more to come. Many more of those students who really want to learn, there's many more to come. Yes, I mean, yes. You did that just with one shade, huh? One shade. You did use multiple shades. You don't play around with all these things. Just one shade. And what a great way to close the dice, Timus. I should put that. Yes. I should put your pictures up here because I picked it up from the internet. Uh, so, Dr. Ravi, how are you? Uh huh. Good, 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 good. How are you? Thank you. Beautiful. Can we have the children's quiet and please? It's, it's really important that we do so. I do apologize, but we need to have a quiet room. And uh, I know everyone's excited. Uh, I used to have children once, a long time ago. Um, but they're wonderful things. They make your life interesting. Pune, have you got children? No. Oh, okay. I wouldn't ask any further, okay? No more, <laughs> promise. no more questions. I have a guest of his, Dr. Howard here. Can you just show your face? No, you can't see. Come, 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 come. There's Dr. Howard. She's visiting me because it's my birthday today. So she, she came and she did lots of cooking and all that. So you can't talk with a hungry stomach. I said, all right, let's go. Put some fish. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Howard. Um, now, uh, Anything that you want to talk about, because, uh, you know, uh, I'll, I'll talk about, I'm not going to talk about college, but it's there for you to look at and think about it. Uh, but I'll come back to this later on. Uh, later on, after lecture, I'll talk a bit more about this. Uh, but uh, you should be looking at that course. So, uh, Pooja, can you put this link inside the chat so students can actually link it for me? All the sounds. Okay. Just give me a moment, Dr. Sakas. I'll do that. Just put this link there. You got this link. Just uh, this is a one day seminar. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. I have it. So, uh, anyway, today is part of a uh, you know, interesting concept where you get this lot of patients. How do you restore these patients? And I've talked to you all the different avenues mm -hmm. uh, how to think, what to look for. It's not simple, it's complex for me as well, but you know, talk about the complexity of it. Uh, how do we, um, you know, treat those patients, not at a patient level, but also at the, at the dentition level, all the different risk assessments. We'll discuss all this. It's very, very important that um, you have um, you have a good understanding uh, of, um, you know, the, 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 the outcome, the treatment outcome, that is the feasibility. 
so it's very important to understand the feasibility of a trip because to feasibility means to have a knowledge and to an experience and to read the literature and then you based on your knowledge and experience you know if you do this you're going to get that if you don't do this you might not get anything so basically these patients will be abundant in your practices and it's important to treat them at a very high level because you only got one chance to fix the problem. You may get it right. You can't make a mistake here. Uh, that's why I want to talk about this. We've got two more seminars after this. Uh, the last one is, I think, with, with Derek and Mehdi. That's a really interesting one. Uh, I'm not sure what the next one is, but uh, um, it'll be very, very interesting because uh, those of you who wants to apply the skills, we go in detail in the college. In other words, uh, when you look at this, for instance, for instance here, is another one there. Like when we talk about any of the images in the perspectives, and you go for the perspectives, ask for perspectives from poor job will send them to you. Every work here, every work is done by me. And every image is taken by me. In other words, I, the clinician, take the image. Because I can see the case from my eyes. So I get the camera and I'll shoot exactly where I want to shoot. So all these images are taken by me. In other words, it hasn't been taken by a photographer that looks good. No, they're not photoshopped. It is what it is. None of the images in my surgery or any of the actions are photoshopped. Uh, because it gives you an unrealistic picture of what's achievable, what's not. Like when you see things on Facebook, if it's highly photoshopped, well, how are you going to get that achieved? How are you going to achieve that result? It's impossible. But people don't tell you, right? You know, the idea in my... Uh, colleagues and, and, and uh, when we talk about the putting the college together was to give you a realistic and predictable outcomes in your everyday clinical practice. Okay. How to talk to the patients, you know, how to get the information, uh, you know, how to work as a team in your practice. You know, you need to understand that even myself, I have limitations. So I call on other colleagues to come and give me a risk assessment. So I'm going to share risk. Risk is too high. I'm going to share it. And that's why we make decisions to share the risk because few people are involved in the game and uh, it's all for the benefit of the patient. So it's everything's patient-centered. How do you, see, I have a different philosophy that uh, see, the problem today is everything's recipe-based, you know? What's the recipe for this? What's the recipe for that? It's not a cookbook, you know, for God's sake. The cookbook belongs in the kitchen. You want to have a cookbook? You know, if, you, if you're a doctor, you can't think you're looking for a cookbook, then that's an issue because that means you might as well look at a Google and, you know, look at a Google, I Google has on this, that's it. So the patient says, well, why do I need to come and see you? I can find this information on the internet. So it's the same as having a digital smile design. Why do I need to see you? You can get, you can send their photos of some schmuck out of the other side of the world. They can digitally smile and design their smile and send it back to you. So why do I need you? So when they tell me, with a digital smile design, it means like you're a robot, you're not a human being, you're not a doctor, you can't think. Does it make sense? If you disagree, please have a talk to me. I'm happy to... I have a dialogue. I mean, that's something that's really important. We're coming towards eight o'clock. Let's start the game. I think I've been told very nicely. Uh, and it's very important that we teach and we share information. Um, let's go back to the college. And, uh, and once again, welcome. Uh, this is the 12th uh, webinar. And the uh, important part of this is to do an aesthetic assessment, is to be able to work out what our patients' needs are especially when patients are 60 year old and they present your practice uh, and they want aesthetic improvement. Yes. And you find that in many ways, uh, well, how do I start this case? What's the first thing in mind that comes in? And what you have to discuss, as you see on the left side, what factors would you consider when treating failing restorations is that you have to start with the basics because basics is what you've been taught and we will, in the course, we go for the basics, such as risk assessment, carries risk assessment, periodontal disease risk assessment, other pathological risk assessment. And now we'll go for that in detail. And he's a 60 year old patient. She had restorations. This is all Procera. Have you heard of Procera? Anyone has never heard of Procera restorations? No? They were before Zirconia. They, uh, they are high, high, very densely synth aluminium. Uh, it was initially brought out by Noel Vicare back in the late 90s. And then immediately it was removed. But it was a good material. It was a great, but it had a better aesthetics. You could do a lot of things with this material. But nevertheless, um, you know, when we think about 
this patient is, you know, people are living longer, so their cell demands are, you know, uh, need to be met. They are actually also biologically younger than our parents used to be. So someone six years of age today, if they look after themselves, they've got a biology of 40, 45 year old, they can run faster than some 40 year old. So uh, they have a quite a full and vital life. So you're not just treating those patients because uh, they come to your practice. They want to live life. They want to smile. They want to get on and get on with dating, go back to the marketplace. A lot of them have, you know, second or third relations in their life. And that's what you do. So when you're planning your treatments, don't just treat them what you see. Always ask the patient, what, at what stage in your life are you at? Where are you? Why can I help you? So in my opinion, in my opinion, the important part is how to, how to um, fit this case and manage this case at the patient level, at the oral level. And that's very important to understand. And later on, we'll talk about what, be, what is my treatment plan. And based on all the factors, I'll be able to demonstrate what I think. And I'll have to ask your suggestions. So the patient presents, you know, intro assessment. I mean, what, what do you see? I mean, can anyone explain me what would you see in this case? Take your time, you're not in a rush. I mean, what do you see? Um, please like some explanation, have a good look. Let's start with the upper arch, and we're going to go in the lower arch. As it is, what do you see? I'm sorry, the bonus I should have just tried this before. But this is a longer, it's a, a quite an old case. This is in, in almost like a few years now. But what do you see? Uh, Pune, would you like to start, my dear? Yes, of course. Uh, firstly, I could see some abrasion, abfraction, and also recession, and uh, any caries. So firstly, we need to ask about um, characteristic assessment and power functional mm -hmm. habits mm -hmm. uh, because it can cause abfraction, mm -hmm. uh, especially in um, maxilla. Mm -hmm. uh, as I can see, they are V-shaped, so it could be abfraction. And um, regarding the period, um, how often? You do a periodal examination, right? You do you know, periodal charting, correct? Sorry? You do periodontal chart, you'll chart, right? You do chart the periodontal tissues, correct? Yeah, yeah, of course. And then in that, you look at the, the mobility, correct? You yeah. The Mo vitality, probing, and um, um, look at the uh, attack gingiva and the beta uh, attack gingiva. Yes, 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 okay. Uh, we, and uh, naturally, we do vitality testing and radiographs and look at other pathological issues, okay? Uh, I'm trying to sort of direct you in terms of so we can talk a bit more about it. Uh, what, looking at the gums, what do you think? What does it give you? What does it tell you looking at the gum? Um, in, a, in the back area, in the mandibular area, and also in the maxillary area, in the back area, especially in posterior part, uh, I think there is moderate to severe periodontitis because I already there is attachment plaster and it's around two or three millimeter uh, under the. Uh, Where about? Where about? Uh, it, there is already at, uh, attachment plaster and uh, we could see that. So I think in the posterior area, it could be moderate to severe periodontitis and. Uh, because we have severe recession. And we need to probe and test at least the vitality, anything. And we need to complete our examination. I can't hear you, Dr. Sarkis. I think you... It's mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, now you're right. Can you hear me now? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my apologies. My you were talking and I didn't understand. Sorry okay. about that. My apologies. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, severe periodontitis. Uh, when you said periodontitis, it means it's inflammation, correct? Yeah. Uh, so when I, when I look at inflammation, you expect the probing to give you bleeding, right? Bleeding on probing. Okay. Yes. I yeah. expect that. 
but uh, there's a lot of there's a loss of attachment here okay yeah yeah there's of lots of attachment here okay and uh what will give you the opinion that um that we have inflammation in your opinion what would you just looking at this picture why would you say there's inflammation would everyone agree with um for now? I mean, i'm just happy to have opinions here this is only a dialogue, so we just no one's and there's no right or wrong answer. I just like an opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The gums are puffy. The gums are puffy. Okay. All right. Where else are they puffy, Natasha? Mm, I think it's not too bad, but it's like generalized yes. puffiness. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Uh, fine. I accept that. But look at the recession pattern the patient has. Do you think that patients are right hand toothbrush or a left hand toothbrush? Right. The right. It's a tricky question. Okay, it's hard to tell. Yeah. I'm going to tell you it's hard right. to tell. Mm -hmm. But patients are brushing very hard. Why do they have such a recession here? Look at the cram margins. They were placed like uh, 15 years ago. Oh, more than that. And they're Maybe the margins, they actually seal very well. If you notice that, they actually seal very well. So the mm -hmm. recession being passed as cramped, right? Yeah. At the time, when they were placed, they actually seal this too very well. Mm -hmm. A thin biotype. Yeah, thin biotype, I agree. So you can get zirconia that good. This is Procera. Okay, this is an old technology. This is a dense, this is a good, that's a good fit. I mean, I would say this is a good fit. After 20 years, there's a discussion of this actual cement, but it's a good fit. Okay, thin biotype, okay. Uh, what do you think about thin biotype? Where does, hi Arun, <laughs> with thin biotype, where does it tell you about um, overall uh, gum recessions and loss of attachment? How often uh, did she brush? Because sometimes uh, when the patient brush a lot, Mm -hmm. So it can cause recession, firstly, and abrasion. So we need to ask how often, because sometimes um, uh, I can't see plug, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how was the brushing? Yeah. yeah. Can you see a plug in this patient, for instance? Let me help you. I can see the picture. Just there's not a lot of plaque here. She's a really good brusher, but she yeah. really brushes a lot. Good. Yeah, too good. So yeah. I would say the brushing, would you agree, has caused a considerable uh, toothbrush abrasion has traumatized the tissues as well. Yeah. Uh, you can see some repair of the compass of the crown, see, because of the abstract uh, lesions. And you're right on what you said initially. I agree. Uh, okay. Uh, let's assume that you need to uh, you need to um, uh, you need to restore this patient and mm -hmm. uh, uh, let me just show you some more I just want to show you a bit more pictures or some more images here let's go next one uh, what else do you see here carries in a distant area that's right so she's a very good toothbrusher she cleans but we have cares. We're going to do risk assessment. So, what does it tell you about this case? She has acidic drink. Could be diet, acidic diet. Yeah, acidic drink, sport drink. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the medication causing all these things. Though. She's the healthiest sixty-year-old you'll see. She at sixty. She's sixty-three now. I think all sixty-five. She looks stunning. I'm telling you, I'm seeing men and women in their mid-60s, even 70s, in my practice, that's in my practice. They look stunning. Natasha, is that correct or not? Always beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. They look stunning. Okay, so I never bring age into the count anymore in my practice because it's about biological age, it's not a chronological age. So, so, so if we go going to treat this patient the oral hygiene is good. What would you advise the patient? Where did she work? Sometimes, the, uh, for example, a uh, place of working can cause, because it's outer surface of the uh, teeth, so it can affect. 
Um, or, and like uh, a workplace. That was the old shop, days. When I used to work in the, for instance, uh, in the, uh, when I used to work, for instance, uh, factory. in a factory or in a smelters, where there was a lot of um, a city like a battery factories, right? Yeah, and, like battery um, and making battery or something. Like so that. in many ways, so when you have a decay towards the front part of the tube, where yeah. it's easily accessible, correct? It's easy to clean. What does it tell you about this patient? Well, you have a decay here. Yeah, she so, the first social six. Yeah, but there's no plug there. There's no yeah, plug. Yeah, good, good pressure as well. Yeah. Yeah. So, what am I thinking for this patient? Maybe reduce the library flow. Well, okay, the reduce the library. What else? What I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. well, I'm, I'm trying to classify the risk factors here. What is one thing that really concerns me about this patient? The acidity of the saliva? Yes, but there's more than that. It's not just saliva. But if people can have low salary, I can still maintain a good oral hygiene. Something tells me, let me help you. Something tells me that this patient is... Excessive over teeth. So what sort of question would you ask about something to do with brushing teeth? Okay, something with toothpaste. What would you say to this patient? I think the type of toothbrush as well. Okay, yes, fine. But what I think, just to help you along, is Laurel. Dr. Sarkis Aiden says fluoride. Fluoride, right. So she's brushing with a toothpaste that doesn't contain any fluoride. Oh. See what mm. I'm saying? It's a simple question. I'm trying to make you think because and she's got a high risk for dental caries. So this is almost like a root caries formation there. And that's come. So when you get root caries, in the module one, we talk about root caries. In module one, we talk about the caries risk assessment. Because if you start doing dentistry for this patient without assessing all these factors, and you feel really good, here's a patient going to spend all these thousands of dollars in my practice. You start taking these crowns out. You're going to find that your core tooth underneath the foundation core tooth on this those crowns is just a melt away before you know it, you're going to lose all those teeth i can show you because so far those crowns are providing very good seal so the first thing we will do in my practice especially my hygienist and all my colleagues that's natasha is in change the fluoride and i always have to improve the 5000 ppm sodium fluoride with a probably tooth mousse and really tell the patient they're going to use fluoride and we apply topically we reduce the risk factors there's no way I will see this patient and do a treatment, doesn't matter how much money she has, doesn't matter how far she wants to proceed without reducing the risk for dental caries, okay? Okay, so it is very important to understand that a lot of this toothpaste without fluoride, although and they don't drink the local water, so all this organic diet sometimes with lack of fluoride causes problems. So, so what? What would you say to a patient that refused to have fluoride? Well, I will say that if you refuse to have fluoride treatment, we really can't treat you because I can't prevent further decay formation around the new restorations. And I don't really know what I'm going to find when I remove the existing restorations. Mm. Because that is the, you need to write this in your letters to the patient. Mm. So when I see dentists, colleagues writing patients, comes in, it's just a quote, I'm going to crown number one and two. You know, feeling here, feeling there, means nothing. What is rationale behind your treatment? What is your risk assessment? So this is all really important. Okay, so high cares risk. I'm going to show the x-ray, and don't be alarmed when you see the x-ray. It's all been fixed, but I'm going to show the CT. You can see we have problems. We have problems. Okay, and we have problems. And we have problems. Okay, so it tells you that something is quite drastic happening here. Okay. Gonna, patient will say to me, am I going to lose my teeth? And I will say, no, as long as you do what we tell you. And I explain to the patient what they have to do. So we change this patient's whole being into accepting the long-term consequences and understanding there's a rationale, the protocol that they have to adhere by, okay, the he by, so we can help them. Because once you invade this teeth, you own this problem. Okay, patient got long roots, very strong roots. The tooth number two says go guard the prognosis. I suggest we take this out for an implant in, in, in the early game, not. 
I mean, there's a root depth report here. You can name it. If I go one by one, so I get a CT scan or cover of CT, and I'll go with tooth by tooth, tooth by tooth. I'll just look at exactly each tooth on its own merits. And also vitality assessments. You can't assess vitality under the crowns. It's just very difficult to do. Okay, so you have to explain that to the patient. It's very difficult to assess vitality under the crowns. Okay. And there are many ways, but it's just difficult. Okay. You need to understand that patients also need to own the problems. So a lot of these complicated cases, you know, sometimes we see before and after, but I want to know what happened in between. Okay, in between is the real key. So controlling the pathology, such as epical pathology, radiolucency, okay. Uh, working in a way to maintain integrity of the tooth core, reducing the risk carries, risk status of the patient. Patients got some periodontal issues, but not many. This is the fixable. Okay. So it's a beautiful lady, very intelligent, well known. So the diagnosis. Did you ever think about giving diagnosis to your patient? Let me tell you, what's my diagnosis? So how would you, in a few words, describe? If you, let's say you're referring this patient to me, how would you, in just one sentence, explain to me that here's my diagnosis? Hard risk patient in dental care. And in dentition. Okay, that's, that's one way. In one word, okay? I, I would say in, in, in a sentence, right? In a sentence. So when we have diagnosis, okay, it's based on your clinical findings or clinical tests and radiographs. Diagnosis is simple. Uneven tooth wear, can't a smile on, failing restorations, gum research, creating an aesthetic, an aesthetic disturbance. That's what she's here for. Dr. Sarkis, someone said failing restorations due to the lack of fluoride as a diagnosis. You, know, you can't say due to the lack of fluoride because that's recent decay. The decay was active. Patients change their diet, change their habits. You have to understand the whole psychosocial situation. I accept that. But I'm not going to say lack of fluoride because you're making a causal relationship. Your diagnosis shouldn't be a causal issue. It does diagnosis should be as you find what you think and as a reason. Patients come with children from bureau the problem list, what you initially can find. Okay, so there's a lot of things in here that you can say. Okay, failing restoration will tell you a lot of things, conversations, all these things. So in many ways, many ways, he's our patient. He's our patient. He's a smile line. So, what else do you see? Let's assume that we restored the patients, uh, reduced the carriage risk status, patients being very compliant, coming into practice for a long time, and all the root therapies are completed, all the foundation restorations are completed. Now we're ready to look after this patient. What would be the next thing that you would do? And the patients are very compliant. What do you see here? I know everyone is dying to remove these crowns and just to die to remove it, you can make some beautiful crowns because anything will look better than this. I accept that, okay? But just think, sit back for a second. The name of the game, what we teach at the college, is to slow down when you're doing dentistry. You can't rush a good, high quality dentistry, okay? So, what do you see here? Dr. Sarkis, um, as a question, can there be prescribed medications causing? saliva flow and failing restorations. Okay, here's the issue. In this particular patient, uh, when you have medication, you have polypharmacy related, okay, affecting salivary quality and quantity. This patient is health fanatic. We see all of these patients who have this problem with decay because they don't use fluoridated toothpaste or they don't drink fluoridated water. Okay, that's a major problem. So, uh, to me, I cannot create a causal link to that at the moment because there's other people who don't do that and have perfect teeth, so it's very hard to say. There's other factors involved here with... Uh, okay, so there's other factors involved here, such as the type of bacteria causing problems and mutants and lactobacillus and all that, which are very virulent. So that, I'm not gonna go into that, but basically that was the initial diagnosis. You can say you feel that after the diagnosis that patients have in your history, you say, you know, we feel it with polypharmacy causing a co you know, reduction, it causing co polypharmacy affecting the quality and quantity of saliva. Yes, that's a fair ask. That's a fair 
okay? Then you ask the patient if they've had medication. If your patient comes in every six months, and if I'm, my God, I see the K, I know this patient very well, the question will be, has there been any change in your health status, okay? And that's important to ask. And the patient, oh, yes, look, I had to change my blood pressure medication, or I'm taking the antidepressants because I just feel a bit depressed, okay? Mm -hmm. There's also some comments saying more teeth and gingiva showing on the right side compared to the left. And um, I, then Diana also says, I can I think see a deficiency of the buccal corridors and also very thin lips and the right side angle of the teeth are more inclined. Very good. Okay. You see more of the gum arches on the right side than you see on the left side. Why is that? Because of the method of the brushing, because but we need to ask the patient that uh, we, uh, are you right-handed or left-handed? It depends mm -hmm. to the brushing technique with which hand that uh, the patient. Okay, okay. I'm going to help you. Um, Diana suggests passive eruption. Sorry, no. Okay. Uh, I think. All right. Look, they're all possibilities, but I'm going to. I'm going to just point something else out to you and. Uh, I'll point something else to you. Uh, if you look very, very carefully, that's why I have these slides are specially chosen because it's an important part of teaching in the college. Most of the problem you see the gum asymmetry, and that was well observed, is not because the gum asymmetry is actually the upper right lip is higher than the smile, but you didn't see that because you're not looking at the lip frame, but you're looking at the teeth. It's how you've been trained as dentists. We retrain your brain to think differently, and that's how we teach. So in this case, there's a mobility harm where the lip has a symmetric um, mobility and then during the smile, if you look very carefully, you can see it. this is fine and it's not, okay? And that gives you the appearance also, this is less more of a, you know, larger cord than that one. And that's possible that there's a movement of the, of the lip to the side and I accept that. So there's been inclined inside, patient was initially probably class two, the one type with a narrow maxilla and the, uh, Veneers and crowns will improve the expanded. I accept that. And uh, doesn't want any form of orthodontics. That's another point. So when we restore this, we'd like to improve on that. And I accept that as well. That's a very, very good point. Any other points you'd like to make? I think we're good for now. Excellent, excellent. Well, what I normally like to do here is if you look very carefully in this particular case, is I want you to think visually. Okay, you can see the lower smile line coming down and it tends to disappear there. Okay, when mm -hmm. the patient opens the mouth, you're going to see something else. And when you look at the smile dynamics, okay, you can just see that that's not too bad, it goes higher up and drops in. So, when we're trying to restore this patient's mouth, you need to, you got the opportunity to create even planes. One else, I'll see, but there's a lot of things that I see that. I need to restore. What other things would you see from, you know, from your point of view that will concern you for a female patient specifically? Not enough, not enough top teeth. Yes, but I want you to know, I want them to answer the top. I think Krishna gave that away. We have inadequate, uh, maxillary incisors showing. showing during the, the smile and the speech dynamics. And that's something with the patient's main complaint. What else is a concern that I see? There are just some comments, um, the color and the shade. Yes, color the shade. As in, I think there's some issues with the color and shade of the teeth. If, the, if you went ahead and you restored this patient and improved and Hello. Yes. Sorry, I'm just going to read the other one to you. It's Yahweh's Is she a mouth breather? No, she's pretty normal. She's mm. not pretty mm. I think in the rest position, um, especially in women, if, if you want to be more attractive, it's better that the tissue of the maxillary incisor should be more than that. And um, regarding the mandibular incisor, they are longer. So in a small anesthetic uh, view, um, uh, it, you know, the, the tooth show of the mandibular incisor is more. 
And so um, maybe, uh, and also the plan of the uh, mandibular incisor with the uh, plan of posterior area are not in the same place. It is a little bit uh, um, extruded and uh, um, it's higher. There's also a suggestion for um, the over eruption of the 3 3 and the yeah. 3 4 by um, Dr. Ravi. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Dr. Ravi, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ravi, Dr. Ravi, is it Ravi? Yeah, okay. Good question. Uh, yes, um, perhaps angular colitis as well. Angular colitis here, yeah. And um, Monica says perhaps bite or broxa. By brush patients, definitely brush. So, where do you see the brush of faces here? Can you see the brush of faces? That's going to answer your Russian problem. Where is she brushing? Can anyone tell me where is she brushing? Okay. She's brushed in the right side. Can you know she's brushed in the right side? Here. And she's not brushed in the left side. So that's not over erupted. This is just worn down. Mm -hmm. Okay. Am I making sense? Um, Diana says it's, I'm not quite sure what she's trying to say, but I think she's saying we can see it on the OPG. The, maybe the pattern. Oh, you drew a lot computer. Sorry, here? Mm -hmm. Here? Yeah, maybe um, the bruxing pattern, is it more visible on the OPG? I think that's what Diana is trying to ask. I see. I, I would uh, go, look, you know, common things that go commonly, I would rather simply, in this particular patient, she's definitely bruxing on the right side. There's no question about that, okay? You can see the level in size of the plane. It's bruxing here, that's left. So canine's been protecting over here. So there's a canine rise and this is more of a group function slot. That's what happens. As she wears, you can see the brush of facets here. She wears, eventually, there'd be more to fracture on the right side because there's more mm -hmm. of a group function affecting on the right side and the canine guidance on the left side. So when we restore in this patient, we'll come to that in a minute. Have I answered those questions? Can I move on, uh, Natasha? Explain that again as to why you think it's predominantly on the one side obvious. She's grinding on the left side. The canine guard is almost gone. Upper arch is a crown, so there's no wear, so the lower arch will wear. Okay, and just one more suggestion um, was, oh, let me just see you open that. Um, I'm not, um, so just, I think Diana's saying the OPG doesn't show us the angle of the mandible, so it's hard to tell which side she's broxing on, but I think now you've shown the photo, so it makes sense. Now, the LPG, it's, it's a parasitial view of a convex CT, so it's not. Uh, uh, I don't know who's drawing, I'm not drawing. Uh, okay, let's just keep going. Oh, um, good. Go ahead. Yeah, no, great. Keep going. All right. Look, what I would normally do in this particular situation is that I will establish the parameter of my treatment plan. I've got the carers control, I've got the every other control, patient's most compliant. You know, it's been taken a good six months. Mm -hmm. and you can see that there's a good hardness of the enamel. Mm -hmm. It's clean. There's no more plaque. So to me, I need to establish which way I'm going. So in this particular situation, what I would normally do is that there's a habit amongst the profession is to remove these crowns and to go and make temporary crowns. And then you establish your margin, establish your occlusion. That is very, very harsh thing to do because you are committed to this patient. So normally I would do in this situation is I can either do bonded uh, composite restoration. If I'm doubting my diagnosis, I would bond composites here all around, let the patient walk with a new smile line, new function. Or, or based on my diagnosis, I would go ahead and do diagnostic mock-up SATs so I know exactly where I'm going. So you can see the upper arch looks pretty good, optimal. I'll put some composite mock-up on the upper arch just to see where I am. And that, that allows me to assess the speech pattern, the comfort. You note that the lip bump is improved, it's more symmetrical. She's going to have a lowering the right lip, it's more showing here. This is given the opportunity for a patient to view that uh, there's a slight more or less canting of the mandible as well. 
Okay, although this is a wear pattern here, but there's been some issues in the past here. So it's how the physiologic occlusion is established over a period of time. So what I'll be doing eventually for this particular patient is I will be doing some composite buildups here and improving the whole lower mandibular plane uh, while I'm building and doing a real temporization on the maxillary arch. So there's a lot of issues here. And that's what we normally do because it's non-invasive. You know, I don't try to cut teeth unnecessary, but a simple treatment goes a long way. So I still have not invaded teeth. All I've done is place a couple of mock-ups on existing crowns and to create a desired smile line. And this is done by hand. This is not done digitally. It doesn't make sense. You can't test the system. Do you understand why I'm so much sort of against digital smile design in a sense because you can't print a model and put this lump of crap in a patient's mouth and expect them to smile and immediately adapt to it. This is done slowly, one at a time, and people adapt to the speech pattern and she's building smile line. We teach this at the college, and that's what we do normally. So having said that, having said that, is there any questions on this before I move to the next one? Um, I think we're good. Okay, perfect. I'm moving to the next slide. So uh, it's an overall part of risk assessment. Uh, I think uh, one important question we need to ask is um, uh, patient's request to improve the appearance of a smile in the aesthetic zone. And uh, Laurie heard, heard the term aesthetic zone. What is an aesthetic zone? What is it? Can someone enlighten me as what is an aesthetic zone? Anyone? Go ahead. Uh, aesthetic zone. Um, uh, actually, I uh, didn't get that. What do you mean uh, regarding aesthetic zone? So, uh, aesthetic zone. What's an aesthetic? Do you mean zone? like in the uh, front part of teeth, in upper part, in upper arch, mm -hmm. and uh, one third of um, lower arch? I mean. Uh, teeth in a lower arch as well. But mostly in upper part uh, is the aesthetic zone of uh, many patients that are smiling. Okay. Uh, okay, you, you, no, sorry, you said this is the aesthetic zone, correct? Wouldn't it depend for each patient what the aesthetic zone is? I think so too, that's a good point. That's a, that's a very good point. See, for this patient, the aesthetic zone is not just here, it's here, it's there. It's a step here and the whole thing. That's Actually, even Leon, Leone says to me, it's what the patient thinks is their aesthetic zone. Exactly. Patient will decide. <laughs> that's right. That's a very good point, Leone. That's a very good point. Patient determines. So therefore, when we decide to do the diagnostic mock-up, we determine if we are within the aesthetic zone of the patient. We don't determine, and none does the so-called digital smile design. It's the patient and you as a clinician who has this in control. It astounds me how dentists take some crappy digital smile, digital uh, scan or photo, send it to the laboratory and expect the technician to come some sort of a scheme for them. They, I mean, this is ludicrous. You need to own your problem. You need to own the case. And this is a problem with, you know, Digital smile design will make lower technicians rich, but will make your lower dentist also poor because you have no idea where you're going. I will scan my mock-up, then I know exactly where I am. That's a real smile design because I know it's been tested in the system. The dynamics of speech, the comfort, the lip movement, patient feels comfortable. We can also test the, either the anterior guidance and the posterior, you know, the, the exclusion factors. All those occlusion can be tested in one visit. And that's, they've been scanned. You can scan this then, they can manipulate the image as much as you want, but it's a tester system. That's what real small design is all about. You have to learn the art of direct diagnostic mock-up. Doing the diagnostic wax-up is another waste of time because you're still gonna transfer that, same as the digital small design in a printed model of diagnostic impression back to the mouth. So why can't you just start in the mouth and scan it, go back to the drawing board? So that's it. To me, that's what I'd say about few hours on that. So over here, so the problem we have here is, let's assume that carrier's risk is 
completed. Okay, we talked about, you know, patient wants to take improvement in the steric zone. I accept that. All right. Now, what treatment would you recommend from here? Firstly, I think we need to refer the patient to the periodontist because it's been, uh, done. It's been done. It's been done. But tell me, why would you refer the periodontist? Uh, firstly, because uh, the patient has got recession. Mm -hmm. In attached gingiva, sometimes they consider to make it thicker. I know sometimes it's irreversible, but um, the patient, firstly, we need to decrease the length of the cosmetic area because it, it, the, the tooth show would be really long if we want to cover up all of them. So it's better that we reduce the recession and um, control the um, perioperative problem. I have a question for you and for everyone. You send this patient to the periodontist. What would you request? How would and, the patient know what he's doing? I mean, just because you get a patient, he wants to know what, what some critical factors he wants to know from you. Uh, as I mentioned, regarding the recession, and controlling the, the severity there because I think it's, uh, I, I didn't probe it, I, I don't know the um, pocket depth, but maybe it's moderate to severe. So controlling the, the perio problem for is the main uh, and the most important okay. thing and also recession. Yeah, periodontal tissues are normal. There's no bleeding of problem. It's less than 10% of the mouth. The mm -hmm. plumbing is less than 10 mouth. The ginger index is less than 10. She's in perfect health. But you want a patient to send a patient to periodontist. Why? That's a good because point. Because there is a bone loss. Because I could see the bone loss, and so um, and maybe the patient needed graft for the recession. What's that? Yes. Doctor Sack is there. I'm um, so Leonie says she doesn't think that is a perio problem. Um, I think we kind of established that. Yes. And then Aiden says, if I think it's just suggestions of improvement of the aesthetic zone for the patient. Fixed smile, soft tissues, um, Botox on the right side, possible filler. Okay. I love you, Aiden. Thank you for your comments. Um, and then Leonie, oh, and then Sean says, Peria will want to know what you're trying to achieve. And then Leonie says, the gum line may need to be lifted in the right. Gum line to be lifted on the right. Okay. Lifted. Oh, okay. That's fine. Mm. Okay, uh, let me, let's talk about this. Okay, if you were to send the patient to the periodontist, Dr. Sarkis, what would you say? Well, I think... Would I'll, you send the patient to the periodontist? Well, okay, let me answer it differently. You forget where I get, I'll give you a lot of clues in this lecture, but no one's listening. What does this tell you? It was to do with the problem was to do with the lip. No, what does this tell you? The patient is satisfied, right? Yeah, but you want to send the patient periodontist. What this will tell the periodontist if you're going to send the patient? Look, I'm, I'm, I'm trained on both sides of the equation, okay? To me, it's not an issue. I know how to do this. But your general practice, if the specialist point, you please come on board. But if you're in general practice, you want the periodontist, and I agree with you, what would be your instructions to the periodontist? Okay, I've got some comments here. Go ahead. So Farah says, thin and flatten the frenum. I'll just read all of them to you. Neruja says, stabilize the occlusion with buildups on posterior teeth and canine guiders. I don't think that's for the periodontist, that's for us. And then I want Diana to says, she doesn't show her gums when she smiles, so not necessarily will need gingival recontouring. And then Sean says, your diagnostic mock-up tells the perio where your gingival margin should end up. Very good. Sean, well done. I'll give you 100% of the marks. This answers most of the questions, okay? So if I need connected tissue grafting, or free, I mean, usually connected tissue grafting here, uh, I would want to give this, okay, as a guide, okay, to the periodontist. How can I transfer this information to give the periodontist? A scan. So, well, how's he gonna get it? A scan, so what does it mean to him? You know, this guy loves to sit back and 
patient comes in, how does he get a reference point? If he's going to gum grafting, how is he going to get a reference point? Up. With the photo of your mock-up, you can uh, help the periodontist. Photo is good enough. How, how, how accurate is the photo? How can you get... But I, I'm asking, so here's a photo. Is it going to eyeball your graft? I mean, how is he going to do this? Says measure it with a probe. Mm. And? And? Um, I don't know. That's all it says. And then Diana says she goes with the mock-up. She goes with the mock-up. Uh, so how do you take the mock-up to the periodontist? Take the mock-up? Goes into the periodontist with the mock-up. I think that's what she's trying to say. Yeah, how do you take this mock-up to the periodontist? You do left foot one and take the jaw and say, here you are. Well, what do you do? How do you take I this mock-up instruction to the periodontist? I think she means send the patient to the periodontist with the mock-up. With the mock-up. So you're going to do this at the right time. In his practice, it's going to be just ready for you doing nothing else. So the patient turns up. Is that correct? So don't forget, this patient came for a mock-up. Okay, It takes about an hour or so to do this mock-up properly. How would you transfer this information to the patient? It's very simple. And that's important. So the way I would do this, okay, um, you remove each shell, you refine each shell, and number them. All the periodontist has to do is to click them in there and decide where to do it. It's as simple as that. You can do a clear pull down, but it has to be very accurate, but individual shells are the best outcome. You can make like a little snap on smiles. You can join this together with a composite and just flick the whole thing, and there's the best guy. Adjust your margins where you want the story margin to be, and it's a good guy for periodontics. It's that simple. So this is what we teach at the college, okay? You know, if I give you a recipe, you never learn, but I'll tell you how to think, you'll find better solutions, better than mine, better, better than me, in terms of finding the results. So here's the patient, we did all this, okay? We did all this, okay? One thing I want to know, ladies, this is a question for you. What would, if this was your mouth, what would be most critical to you? What else am I thinking? If you, had to, if you have this mouth, what would be something very important to you that you'd never want to have if you have new crowns, whatever? It's a hard question. Toothpaste. <laughs> Changing the toothpaste to the fluoride one. Okay, it's all down to a face. But I'm talking about the smile line, what you see. Something that's going to happen to this patient is more and more. Something that's very important to me to maintain. What would that be to maintain? The midline. Of the midline, okay. Let's very go. Very nice start. Okay, midline. What else? What else? Something very important. Some, I'm going to read some comments to you, Dr. Sarkis. So, Genus, I think I'm saying your name correctly. I apologize if I'm not. It says lots, loss of tonicity. Le, um, Leody says no dark margins showing. Mm -hmm. um, Anna suggests discolored margin. Mm -hmm. And then Priya says where. And then um, Agan Chair says the vertical height would reduce. And Supriya says an over eruption of the lower teeth. Dr. Ravi says, could we consider restoring the bottom teeth, which I on? And um, Catherine says, no black triangular space. Fantastic. Catherine, I'm going to take your point here. No black triangles. Very good point. Now, what is it in this particular area that tells me there's a good chance I'm going to get a black triangle for this patient? Have a look at what your thin biotype, your thin biotype, what is an aesthetic risk factor for this? Thin biotype, high scalloping gum margins, correct? Very high scalloping, sharp papilla, you've got a very sharp papilla. And you have triangular teeth. See, triangular teeth are a high risk factor here. Okay, you always look at the triangular teeth. So how would, what would I have to do to reduce this from happening? Can anyone help me? Um, there's a, well, when you say triangular teeth, what exactly do you mean? Okay, this is two here, the two here. Mm. Can you see that triangular? Yeah. Square. Okay. Am I making sense? It's not square. This is triangular teeth. She actually had a smaller teeth. It's triangular teeth. So it's not square teeth. It's not ovoid. It's not square. This is triangular teeth. Okay. So yeah. in biotype triangular teeth, the blood supply here is critical to the papilla, tip of the papilla, the interdental colis. Okay. If you damage this during your preparation, 
it's finished. It's not going to come back. You'll traumatize the connective tissue. You'll let go. It will never come back. Okay? This is what happens all the time. Patients have crown regional. I'm at my door sometimes. And I say what the problem is. I've got black triangle. I like the original shape of my teeth. This gum is missing. And then it creates a big, wide dominoes. Not going to bring it back. There's only one chance of it. Um, the suggestion, or oh, I'm not sure if it's a question, it says go more proximally while crown prepping. Go, I'm so sorry again. I'm not sure what they're trying to say, but Sufriya says go more proximally while crown preparation. Go more proximally, like go deeper mm -hmm. proximally. I think, is that what you're trying to say? Um, um, as in, okay, he says go more proximally while crown preparing mesia distally. More and then, mm -hmm. okay. and that, that's one comment. And then Sean says restore teeth with broader contacts, extrude teeth with ortho before restorative rest restore. Okay, this is very big step. I'm thank you for your comments. It's generally appreciated. But you guys are talking like a mechanics. 16 year old patients are not going to go for that. Okay, you know, female, six-year-old, is not going to go for orthodontics. It's rarely they'll do. And you're going to extrude the tooth to get improvement. It won't happen. I can show you. It's very admir admirable that you think like that. You give the options to the patient. Let's say the patient refuses to do. Something you have to do very carefully is what you have to do to reduce this papilla from disappearing. Um, um, Sam says, place temporary crowns to color the gum. Cover the gum. Okay. All right. And when we have a uh, dark triangle, we can go a little bit uh, deeper, not equigingival. I mean, up to uh, half a millimeter, um, we, we can go uh, to the free gingival. And it can, uh, when we go deeper a little bit, uh, uh, we can make um, our uh, crown wider because we need to finish it deeper. And it's the first option. And the second option is that uh, if the main, our main concern is the hygiene of the patient, sometimes we can inject filler in some areas, but in this case, no, because when we have a large diastema, we, we need to sometimes do that. But in this case, I think if we go a little bit deeper, more than echogingival, I mean, half a millimeter, we can uh, close the dark triangle. All right. Let me let me ask you a question with a question. Okay, we need to really talk about this. This is important. Okay, this is very important. Uh, let me rephrase this a bit more for you. Okay, if you put a filler here, you put a filler there, and what sort of filler do you intend to put? Filler in yeah. in the in the um, point of uh, in the exact higher point of uh, papilla. Yeah, what sort of filler would you put there if you're going to put filler? Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Sir. What type of filler would you put in the papilla here? Uh, what type? What type? Medium, high density, low density. Which one? I didn't do that before because I never uh, do the value because I think in this case there is no uh, need to do that because there is no diastema when we have a large diastema and when I have a large diastema I, I offer to the patient go to the orthodontist because it's very really large yeah. so but in that case I didn't do that but uh, I believe um, nowadays it's a, one of the solutions that we can do that yeah. so I can't say to you what type Okay. All right. Who would do filler here and there? If you're going to do it, what density of filler would you use? Please answer. Dr. Sarkis, Diana suggests that we do good temporaries. We finish the margins with ultrasonic instruments and make sure there is no cement left. And then Janice says, we need to prepare the tooth and give the ceramist enough room to create a new emergence profile that closes the gingival embrasure form and keeps a smooth contour that maintains proper periodontal health. The preparation must continue through the contacts and ideally end at the mesial and distal line angles of the tooth. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a very admirable um, way of saying, and I accept that. So my answer is 
contemplating any type of field of singularity, especially thin biopath, first there's no volume of tissue here at all. I can tell you straight out. You can almost see the bone, that's why it's so it ever seed. Second is the fact that if you try to prove filler, it's gonna be a very high density filler and they're obvious. Those high density fillers, you can see them right there. It looks ridiculous if you put fillers there because look very nice. There you got little white dots hanging between the gums. Wouldn't work. There's not a lot of good data in the literature on this. I've read enough of this, and it's not really highly recommended. And please don't try the fillers because they'll disappear. Your cram margin will reappear, and everything. Yeah. Now let's go next stage. Okay, we talked about this. Okay, we talked about this. So the treatment recommendation is we talk about the diagnostic mock-up. If you want periodontists to do connective tissue grafting, we can do that. Does anyone in the audience do connective tissue grafting? Do you know how this is done? Or you like the first thing they do? If you haven't done it, that's fine. I'll, I'm not gonna go too much in detail, but I just wanna know what the audience is thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's look at the treatment sequence, okay? We talked about controlling phase. We control the decay and we control the brushing habits. We've got fluoride application here. If you go to diagnostic phase, you have a diagnostic mock-up, we discuss the patient all the possibilities, okay, including orthotic treatment, including intrusion, including extrusion, including whatever you want to talk patient understands, and then we go in depth and treatment, and we go reassessment, okay? Now, we have to learn how to bend the rules sometimes, okay? Now, let's keep moving on. So what I did in this particular patient, and I'll show you later on, when I was making a temporary for her, I did some, uh, you know, crowns all around the place, and now so, refine the crown margin, I adjust the proximal areas. Uh, you can see the space here, I'm gonna come back and fix that later on, but um, I tend to play a lot with cases, okay, to make temporaries. And when we make a temporary for this patient, we make the temporaries for the patient, okay, that is short of these margins. Do you know why? Can someone help me? Tell me why. As a matter of this margin is too long. This is not careless by it's sustaining in the bottom. Uh, any question? Natasha, anyone writing anything? I'm happy to answer the question. Mm, yes, let me look. Guidance for perio. Guidance for perio, very good point. I'm guiding the tissues, right? See, what happens is you need to remove these little bumps in this complex case. And I'm gonna give you a bit of time, I'm gonna reassess these tissues. You can already see by removing what I need to do, we're getting some sort of a gingival symmetry. We're not taking the kind of lip pattern as well, but this getting some sort of symmetry. And when we look at the, on the side, the crown just fits, allows me to assess how my gum response is going to be for this patient. With very gentle brushing, always short, okay, allows this gingiva to thicken with time, okay, mm -hmm. and allows them to see. But the most important thing, what we talked about, was to maintain the steepness, okay? So this is complex. This is complex. Don't expect you to do this, but it's complex. Now, this margin is about one and a half, two millimeters below the gum here, approximately. Can, yeah. you, see? Mm -hmm. Can you all see that? Okay, all mm -hmm. right. Can you also see something that's really, really important? What do you think? Uh, Bob well, Laurie, you say you are invading the biologic width. Is that correct? Okay. Can you see how we're invading biologic width here? We're way down. Okay. So in other words, uh, if I was doing a zirconia prep with 0.5 to 1 million margins, I'll be really cutting into this tooth structure. Okay. So can you also see something very important, how we maintain the sharpness of this papilla? Okay, this is very sharp, okay? They're all very sharp, okay? So we, we try to maintain anatomy during our preparations, the individual, okay? So this is critical in a set exam. Because if you lose this papilla, you're going to lose it. What's holding this papilla at the moment is that too. What's holding this papilla at the moment is that one. And this one's only that one. So, this one's all about a canine tooth. Oh, it's lost, but that's what we have. You're not going to regain this. You're not going to grow this papilla. At least maintain what you have. And again, we allow time. One week, it's not too bad. Much better. Okay, it's not too bad. Just give me a time. Give me more time. 
you know, and you can see that, you know, we begin some sort of a prudence. If you wait four weeks, it's even better. So when we come back to take impressions, here's my preparations. You see how healthy my gum is. See, it's not like biology here, not mechanics. So we're not about tissue preservation. I'm talking about, I don't want you to be mechanical cutters. You have to understand how to preserve this tissue. That's getting thicker now, that tissue is thin. It's just getting thickening. Tissue is getting thicker. So we have altered the, 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 the bite up of the tissue by understanding how do we prepare those margins without traumatizing. We teach this at the college, okay? And I'm not really worried about the bottom margin. I can fix the bottom margin, not for the vertical margin, that's not the issue. And that allows them to think in terms of, this is before, okay, these are preparations, all right? Here's my preparation, okay? And again, looking at the same angle, and here's my preparations. You can see that more or less, there's some, you know, about a millimeter drop in the gingival margins right across the board. Okay, so we're in a position now to assess the patient, to assess how much reduction required. We can open an inclusion, so no much reduction is required at all from my end, but nevertheless, you got thick gingival with sharp edges. You can see how clear they are, okay? You know, minimal, minimal trauma uh, to the gingival, the patient. So what I'm trying to say to you, when we are talking about preparation, you see everyone showing how many birds, what type of birds it is. It really doesn't matter what birds to use. It's about how managing the tissues and not the preps. Just what you think about. It's all about the tissues surrounding your preparations. Now this is at the time of cementation. Does anyone know what sort of cement this would be, this white bit here? What is it? Do you think it's a resin-based cement? Anybody? It's mm -hmm. healthy tissues. We have healthy tissues at a time of cementation. Okay? And my preparation line is probably way down here. And you could tell me that I have violated every biology weed in town. Is that correct? Does it look like if I violated biology weed? Anybody it's agrees it's or disagrees with me? Yes, I agree. You'll disagree, huh? The, so have I violated or have not violated? You've under-violated. You've, under you've, you've built it. I've built the tissues. So when, you talk yeah. about when, the, when other colleagues talk about violating biologic wheat, they need a hole in their head or grow some horns because that doesn't work that way. You've mm -hmm. got some literature, learn how the literature is said, how the meta-analysis is made, how people make their measurements, read the specimen number, look how they do every little test before, and then look at your clinical judgment, how you go about doing it. So we took special bonus. You can see the gum lines, I decide where the gum line will be. This is special, if this is too high, it's gonna come down. And again, I can decide where I want to position my gum margins. Because when you do those zirconia restorations, I'm very sorry to tell you, you're cutting too much tissue structure, and your fit is never good. You start bringing a resin cement up here, you're finished. Okay. Natasha said, you're being very rude, Dr. Narbanian. I'm sorry, I'm not. Because I don't want to see the margin up gingerly, okay? That's a resin cement you cannot remove. Past a millimeter, it's impossible. Like it's impossible. You've got some compliments that your preps are beautiful. I'll oh. give you that. Not from me, from other people. Good. Please write your names, I'll send them. <laughs> There's a bowl of wine. I'll send these flowers, okay? I'll send these flowers. That's not for you, that's for Linda. That's for <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Okay. So you can see the health of these gums are very important. Okay. Very important. So what we do from here, then we use a bonus, we open that bite and, uh, you know, we take the impressions. The bite is different. There's a composite build-up here. Unfortunately, you can't see it. Mm -hmm. You've got a platform on the mandible composite build-ups. This is not the full lecture. I can give you the full lecture, but I'll give you an example. Then we take those special bonnets, and then we have our crowns. They're metal ceramic, some of them use. There's metal ceramic crowns. Uh, because at subdigital margins, this gold will go and disappear because the problem is zirconia cannot remove the discoloration from the gum margin. 
-hmm. because it's impossible to move the dark root coming through thin biotar. The only thing you can get to that level of depth subjectively is with gold margins. Gold is a natural color. It's bio, it's well, most bioinert material we know. I mean, not enough is bioinert, but gold is close to it. And the problem you're gonna have is a cement in there. If you cement the cornea with a resin-based cement, because you're gonna have more gum recessions, then you have a real problem. So when I talk about, look, you know, I don't like really the cornea crowns most of the time, people say, mm -hmm. out. because I'm not, I'm not, um, I haven't been, I just say, I haven't been bought up by companies who bring the cornea material here. And I don't belong to anybody. This is my clinical judgment for particular patient-centered needs that my patients deserve the best from me. And I can give a literature substantiate what my findings are. So these are individually made, okay, crowns that we've been doing for a long time and gives them the best retention with a very simple cement that's biologically stable and has been tested more than 200 years. Okay, this is a time of cementation. We have absolute health in this patient. And when you think about it, look very carefully how the this, this proximal margins are contoured. These are 30 microns, and my marginal gap is 30 microns. Okay, less than 30 microns is done on a special copper plated dyes. Okay, and if you look really, really carefully, we make a special digital margins that tells me where the porcelain stops and the gold begins subgingivally. Okay, so this gives me a very accurate description where I'm going to be. Okay, it removes the guessing game from the equation. I indebted to my very good colleague and mentor, Dr. You know, Professor Terry Walton. Nobody wants to learn this technique, but he taught me. Okay, and it's very important to understand. So we go back in. This is before. Just going recapping again. You have the end point in mind. All right. Remember what I said before, and then we have our crowns. And finally, we're going to try these crowns in. I know you can say, well, that's just some gum and gold. I understand that. But I also know biology. This is the initial trying of the porcelain work. It's some of the gold here. It doesn't bother me. I'm not worried about it because tissues are more important. If tissues are healthy, this will disappear. This will yeah. come down. Yes, question? No questions? No questions. Okay, this leads me to do zinc forces cementation. If you haven't had a chance to experiment with zinc phosphate, I suggest you do. Because a resin cement two millimeters up usually ain't gonna be nice to these tissues. But zinc phosphate will dry up, you just flick it off and away it goes. I think Leone Clark knows all about zinc phosphate. Am I right, Leone, if you're listening? Okay. So it is important to accept the system. No, Dr. Sarkis. Keep so going. Two weeks post op and it looks like my tissue Beautiful. has come down. Yeah. This will come down. All right. Is that to, mainly to do with the cement you've used? And, yes. And also the also the subjectival margin of more than 30 microns. But you can see so why some some people don't want to use zinc phosphate? What's the second best cement you recommend? No, second best zinc phosphate is the best cement. Why is that? Can someone tell me? In this book, for this type of crowns, metal ceramic, zinc phosphate is the only cement you can use. Any takers? Um, so Aiden wants to know why not GIC? Yeah, see if it says can you rule GIC sub gingivally? Yeah. Say that yeah. again. Can you remove GIC sub gingivally? Oh, no. Right, that's the answer. Good question, Adrian. But you can see here, there's a bit of redness here. Can you see that? You have to be, you have to be critical of your cases. When you have a bit there's a little bit of redness here. Question? Okay. So this redness means there's a residual cement there. So easily I will just, with a triplex, I'll flick it off. It's just sitting there. It just comes off because a 30 microns cement will break, two millimeters just come off there. But there's no zinc, there's resin cement or GRC will break, they'll be bonded to the two structure. And looking at the different angles of this patient, you can just see it, you know, we have a healthy gingival margin, a healthy gingival margin. The crown margin is about two millimeters of gingivally all around the place. Okay. And this is what we do. 
I hope that today's lecture demonstrates some important points. That you need to understand that there's a lot of that has been done in the last 100 years. And it's been predictable. Just because new materials come into the scene doesn't mean it's better. You know, you can't mill this. You're going to make this. Handmade. You need to be crafted to make this, not some sort of rubber to trim it and shape it and throw it away. I can tell you. Okay, the aesthetics of this is, you know, for this patient, this is the best treatment. Okay, if she had an alpha enamel, I could consider Emacs on, on equal gingival, subgingival margins, but this is deep. So the question I have to ask to you, what happens when you have to replace existing crowns that's been there for a while? How do you go and try to replace the cornea crown subgingivally and remove your cement that's two millimeters subgingival? Sorry, before we, uh, I think some people are trying to leave because um, I think we're just over the one hour mark. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop in the link. We've actually got a short course coming up um, on composite uh, rehabilitation uh, of one dentition. Uh, I'm just going to pop the link in for that in the chat. So if anyone wants to register for that, um, then they can do that. And I'll also put my number through on there. You can message me directly, every, anyone who wants to, um, if they wanted to register for the course as well. Yeah, I've put the link on the chat and I've sent my number as well. So if you want to um, enroll, um, you can fill out the link, but also send me a message saying you've done that and we can organize the seminar. Um, for those who want to attend. Sorry to interrupt, I just had to say that before. Uh, maybe it's on Sunday 23rd, so in the state people can also attend. So, so it's, yes, yeah, Sunday the 23rd, it's a full day hands-on course and um, lectures and you'll pretty much learn how to um, restore worn teeth in one visit. So I've sent the link through on the chat and my number as well. Sorry for the sidetrack. And anyway, uh, Aiden has suggested that, well, sorry, there's a question, which cement lasts longer, resin-based cement or zinc phosphate? And then Aiden says the lateral seemed narrower than the try-in. Was, what was the method, methodology behind that? What was the question again? Go ahead. Um, oh, let me open that again, yeah, sorry. Um, so Faranaz's uh, Farah first question is, um, in terms of the longevity of the cements, do you prefer resin or zinc phosphate? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. What's well, I don't know, what's your answer? <laughs> the question is, is it the cement that determines the longevity of the crown? What determines the longevity of the crown? Is it the cement? What is the weakest link of the crown that's attached to the tube? What is the weakest link? The cement. The cement. What's okay, that's a good point. That's good. But what, <laughs> what reduces this weakest link when you're doing crown? What do you do? Retention to... length of the our preparation. Uh, these are, we, we need to get um, the retention from the preparation, not the cement. Okay. What is retention? The being parallel, the, the, uh, we need to prepare as parallel as we can with. Uh, can you explain to me what's retention? Like, if you define what's retention, like in terms of if you look up the dictionary, what is the retention of the crown argument say? It's what? Retention is when you remove the crown, okay, away from the path of insertion, correct? Yeah. Would that be correct? So here's the path, you remove it, correct? If it's, yeah. a, if yeah. it's more parallel, it's more yeah. retentive. If it's taken, yeah. it's less retentive, correct? Yeah. That would be, uh, Natasha, are you happy with this answer? Stop, to stop, to stop. Okay, now. Yes, next, now I've got one other question. Well, mm. I don't. Uh, well, I guess I do too, but it's Aiden's question. Yeah. The lateral seem narrower than the try-in. What was the methodology behind this? What's the lateral seems to try to try and um, in that priorities. Which one? This one here. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that's what he's saying. Narrow than try. That one. I mean, he said the laterals look narrower in the trying than they actually do in the final point. That's the trying. Here. 
Mm-hmm. It's narrower in the trine, and then in the final one, it's not as narrow. Is, is that true? No, it's probably angle of the camera. Oh, sorry, Aiden. Aiden's uh, Aiden, if it's the narrow, it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, we haven't changed anything. This one's straight in the mouth, actually. We didn't even adjust the occlusion. We didn't even adjust the occlusion. You just, you just mentioned the other way around. Sorry, say that again. Which way, Aiden? Is it I think a um, the lateral seam. I think they're narrower in the. Ah, oh, the before. before. No, the he's saying the final. Yeah. In the final, it looked narrower. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, look, we have to. It, it looks narrower. It's actually. It depends on line angle development of the crowns. Okay. In the middle. No, not worry about me. It's a line angle. We didn't want. You don't want to maintain what she had and you, you just improve that. So it looks narrow because of the line angle. It's actually the same width. It's just a line angle. See the line angle here, Ethan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a oh, okay. I think yeah. we've answered. Yeah, we answer yeah this, but... that would be the same. A good point, Ethan. That would be the same. Patient one. I accept that. I accept. That. See here, Ethan, see the line angle here? See the line mm -hmm. angle there? Okay. Mm -hmm. This part we don't want. We want to have create a little petite smile. That's what was there. We don't have a sort of a. That's what she preferred at the end of the day. Look, looking at the temperatures. Um, uh, but the, the question was, cements, correct? What is the most important thing about crown dislodging? What prevents crown from dislodging? Our preparation. Firstly, it's the most important. Preparation, but, but I need a bit more, you see. You said retention. What else is important? It starts with R. These are two R's. Retention. And? Um, and resistance. Resistance. Yeah, resistance, retention. Okay, res res rotation and resistance. The problem is with new resistance cements, because they're born to the two, that's been outside the equation. I accept that. Mm -hmm. but, you still need to do preparations that reduce the stress on the cement. Okay, so to me, my preparations are highly retentive. Okay, and I'll rather use biologic cement that I will be able to remove subgingivally. Mm -hmm. So whichever lasts longer, you know, it really doesn't matter. When you remove, have you ever removed zirconia restoration? No, I just removed PFM. <laughs> Okay, can you see the white cement around the PFM? Normally, are you mean? When you remove yeah. PFM, do you ever see the white zinc phosphate around the PF inside the PFM? Yeah, when, when we, you cut it, yeah, you can see it uh, and then you cut it. You can see the white cement, correct? Yeah. And how long have those crowns been in there? I have had many of them, maybe five years, 10 years, seven years. I can tell you, our old crowns have been there for 50 years and I can still see the zinc phosphate cement there. It could be either white or yellow. What does it tell you? It means that the, um, you know, it was over tapered or something and uh, absorb water or maybe something, you know, it was thick because the uh, uh, thickness of the cement uh, sh should be very thin. Uh, so, what um, tells me is that the seal of the crown was very good, and zinc phosphate is just basically was retentive, you know, but just filling up the gaps. And if you have a good rotation resistance form, I mean, you know, I have cemented crowns and bridges with tampon for 10 years because the seal is excellent. It's the fit of your crown that's important that creates reduces the leakage factor. So if you have a resin cement, it's going to leak like hell anyway because resin absorbs water. And uh, do you uh, use uh, zinc polycarboxylate as well for this condition? Because Which, most. I didn't, sorry, I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. Zinc polycarboxylate instead of zinc phosphate. No, I use zinc phosphate because that's becoming more in the, between zinc phosphate and GRC. Zinc She's asking. Do you yeah. Think Polycarboxylate. Yes, polycarboxylate. I don't use it now. Why? I don't experience. Well, I have a good cement. I mean, if I really want to, if I'm worried about retention uh, and it's, uh, I will improve the resistance. If I'm worried about, the, it's not about the cram per se. You're going to look at the whole mouth. 
you look at the forces, then you have to change your occlusion, you understand, to reduce and reduce your forces. There's a lot of things that come into play, not just the crown per se, for resistance and rotation per se, it's a whole thing. Not just one thing. I could have hardly a two millimeter core here, ferrule here, okay, and I can build the whole post-core system. If I can control the forces here, there'll be nothing wrong with those things for years to come. And I rarely remove any, any teeth in the aesthetic zone for an implant because I know what's going to happen in the high smile line. It's not now, but a few years down the track. So it's understanding biology and reducing the risks and explaining to the patient is the key, is the most important factor in getting your you know, satisfactory outcome, both for the patient and from your end clinically, because you know, this is how things work. It's not about mechanics, mechanics is the biology and biology drives the story of the equation. Tissue health is important, okay? Tissue health. This case is now a few years old now, but we've seen this case a few times and, you know, uh, and it, it, we have, I mean, Terry Walton's got a 25 year studies on this, you know, and it's never had a problem. How many gum recessions? I to see the same study as the cornea. Are we ready? And yet we are putting patients with a lot of problems. Okay, I've done a lot of risk going for my rehabilitation for different reasons. But my margins are equal or super gingival most of the time with low smile line, you know, reducing the stage zone. Case selection is important. I just want you to think in terms of not jumping there and cutting teeth. Think before you cut. And to me, that's the most important thing. And again, you know, when you talk about treatment planning, the sequencing, you know, you need to plan for results and not for procedures. I hope I'm making sense of all this. Any questions on the college? I'm happy to talk about college. Thanks a lot for your information. It was very helpful. Like how my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. We talk about this in the college, right? We go through, you learn how to do these cases, you can do on your patients, you can show them the preps, I can, you know, we have a laboratory set up to help you. It's a two year program, you know. The diagnosis of photography is most important. A lot of those of you who've done the diagnosis photography course, let me tell you, this is different. This is a different photography. I actually run 90% of this photography course because I'm going to tell you how to take photos. Every, all the photos are my photos. I take my photos, okay? I teach you how to take photos. I can't get you a non-dentist telling you how to take photos, how to plan treatment, occlusion and a TMD facial care. We have composite reconstructions, that's a gem. Two frame management, that's, that's everyday dentistry. Periodos and aesthetic, we, we actually discussed today, one, two, three, four, five, six in one setting. Then we talked about two support, but the seven, okay? And we talk about dental, well, we don't go dental facial aesthetics, but this was a full mouth river health rotation. That's what we did. We restored the mouth in many ways for this patient. I'm not sure if the slides are here. We did a whole mouth. Okay. That makes sense. It's a whole mouth river. I do this every day. But to do this is the last section in, in the module. Because once you get to the level of understanding, then you can have the expertise to do all this and do this with confidence. And that's what we teach. And we, you know, want you to uh, get feel understanding how to do composites, how to build ups, how to create aesthetics. Anyone can do build ups that doesn't look good in the face. I mean, how do I know this is better than that? Well, I look at the patient's eyes. I look at the teeth. I look at the eyes. You know, people smell their eyes, not the teeth. That was Charles Darwin in the late century, 1870, he described it in his first mammal smell with their eyes, not the teeth. Uh, and uh, you're going to have over. 480 CBT hours over 12 modules. So that's something to think about, okay? Uh, and uh, this will qualify you uh, if you want to do later and do a specialty, whatever, you'd be a really good candidate. You'd be a prime possession for those co for the postgraduate training and residency in, in prostate So this, this, this really helps you to get your next level. And I put this course because I believe there's a gap in education. I believe that mm -hmm. uh, we need to help our dentists to get ahead and do the best they can. Happy to answer any questions you have, please be my guest. Dr. Sarkis, I think you should talk about the one day coming because um, that's a very special one that you're not only having a lecture, you're also going to have this 
hands-on demo that is not going to be seen elsewhere. Well, I'm happy to do it. Let me just see if I can get this going. One second. Can you see this? My screen? No? Yeah. Can you see that? Can you see this? Screen? Yes. Can you hear that screen? Can you see that one? All right. Now, uh, I'm sure this is a video, and I'll go for this video again. Take this patient from here and read the instructions in the one video. Do you really want to learn how to do it? In this special. Can't see. Can't see it? Hang on. Wait, that's what I'm asking you. You're saying, you're saying yes. Just one sec. Okay, share. Can you see that? Can you see that now? Yes? No, can't see it. Wait. Wait. Let me see it. F. Share. Just open the. You, yeah, now I can see it. Can you see yeah. it? <laughs> can you see this? Can you see me? Yeah. Let me just do this one more time. Sorry. Take this patient from here and read the instructions in the one reason. Do you really want to learn how to do it? In this special lecture on two way composites, I will condense the most valuable information that you can take to your practice and use them immediately. If you're really serious about improving your direct composite skills and achieving predictable clinical outcome and high patient satisfaction, then this is a course for you. Remember that there are many patients that present to your practice that have immediate needs such as the patient in the picture. Unfortunately, not all have the finances. The problem is that not everyone can afford complex chronic visual work, which is sometimes invasive and extremely costly. But everyone can afford composite reconstruction. As the research shows, composites have good clinical outcomes, they're safer to use, and most importantly, they conserve the tooth structure. That's precious enamel. Now, I took this patient in a matter of a few hours, okay, from here to there. And this result was achieved without pain, without discomfort, and without injections. Now, let me tell you one thing that this was very valuable to my patient. Now, how valuable will this be to your patient? Remember, a great smile. Okay, I think this sums up. Um, if I can um, um, discuss it, I think it sums up the course. Uh, how do we uh, go ahead and uh, you know restore these patients, uh, especially tooth wear? We can have a morning um, lectures, and the afternoon will be all practical. So I want to finish lectures really quickly, get you on the practical side so you can learn, and that's what you take with you because as you're doing the build up of a, on a printed models of a tooth wear, we'll tell you how to do it and how to do a very simple way uh, and doing it aesthetically. Usually, a lot of this is done in one or two shades, and I'll tell you how to go back in and be versatile. And this is the time you get to see me work with you and show you how this is done. Um, and this is one of the simple modules that we also teach in the course. But we decided to do a quick module just to help the students, help the you know, my colleagues in using a uh, new concept of treatment, simplified concept of treatment, that's not complex. Most of the things that you see on Instagram and Facebook are just complex. Like to make things simple. I love simplicity. It's because simplicity means predictability. Think about it, okay? Don't make life complicated. It's very simple. Any questions on this? Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, pleasure. Talk yeah, lots of thank yous. So, yeah, I think we're all good. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Natasha. Thank you, everyone, uh, for being part of this. We got two more seminars after this, and we'll probably think of a few more ideas to throw across the board and continue our seminars as always. So, we got one next week coming up, and then one, uh, no, two weeks coming in, and one two weeks after that. The last one will be very interesting. I have a very complex case up to with Derek. In the orthodontics and um, maybe Rahimi with the endodontics. 
and I finish it with simple concepts that we'll talk about, something to think about. Well, thank you so much for joining me and um, look forward to seeing you next webinar. And any question about the courses, please let Natasha know. You all have a good time. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Happy birthday and happy anniversary, Doctor. <laughs> oh, yeah. Happy birthday again. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Birthday. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I much, much appreciate it. I wish you all well. And, uh, and uh, I have an open door practice. Those of you on the set, any case, of course, welcome. Okay, uh, just happy to help by all means. I just believe that education is delivered in the right way for the dentist to have the right experience, and that's important. Thank you, and have a good night. You too, bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Dr. Sarkis. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Bye, Vivek. Bye, Natasha. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Pooja and Natasha. Special thank you to you and Kevin. Thank you. I think we're good to exit the chat, Dr. Sarkis. So. There you go. I can I stop the show. Talk soon. Yeah. Can you can can you exit on, on your end? Okay, I'm going to just leave an end for everyone. You just leave in for everyone.